and John Petrucci will, we're all set up, we've done the sound. You'll say, okay, I got this riff, I got a new idea, and it'll sound like this. You know, but long, it was just the blizzard of notes, right? And Jordan listens, and then Jordan is playing it. He just learned it, just that quick. He heard it, and he learned, maybe he playing it with both hands, <laughs> doubling it, right? And I'm like, could you just play those first, blah, 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 blah. and I got a pencil and, and music paper, by the way, because if I could play it, I still won't remember it when it's you know, 30 seconds later and the riff is still going, right? And it, so I'm, I'm literally saying, could, could you just play those first eight, no, eight notes shorter? But then Jordan says, you know what? That reminds me of this riff. I can, and, and Jordan does a thing, and John learns it just as quickly as Jordan did. So now... The piece is two minutes long, right? And Mike said, well, then we go into this. And these guys have composed three minutes of stuff. And I'm stand, I'm there in a different room <laughs> in, the, in the bass chamber with the headphones on with my pencil. And I can't, can't play the first riff. So I don't know how to. So that's the way we write. Hi, this is Tony Levin. And we're on the record with Ultimate Guitar. Hey, Tony. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. You're a very busy man. Uh, we're going to be chatting about a lot of the stuff that you have going on, as well as some of the, the stuff you've done in the past, which, uh, again, we could probably talk for several hours, but people would get bored and leave. So um, <laughs> so let's start off with the, uh, you just announced a, a new solo record, the, your first one in, in quite a while, your first proper solo record since, I think, 2007, I'm told. Um yeah. I read that. <laughs> what uh, what made you decide it was time to uh, to do another solo record? Um, yeah, I didn't realize it had been that long, but I work like any musician. I get my ideas and I record ideas. So I've had germs of, you know, maybe 30 pieces uh, in the last 10 years. And uh, about a year ago, I realized if I don't, uh, here's the problem. I get called to do uh, do great tours and I go out on the road, which is what I really love to do. Don't finish, don't complete them. So I thought if I don't make an effort to complete it, it's going to be never this album or when I'm 90 or something like that. And so I intentionally focused on finishing the track, choosing which ones of the 30 were appropriate and kind of where is this album going? What's it mean? And also I blocked out uh, March through May to finish it or, or die, but then go back on the road and do my stuff. And I did finish it in May for September release. And even though we're talking solo record is what we're calling it, you know, there's there's quite a bit of collaboration on there. Uh, how did you decide who you were going to collaborate with? And is it a different process than when you collaborate on other people's records? There's all kinds of processes. Let me say about the word solo, the words solo album. I, I, uh, I'm a big fan of Ron Carter. The all bass players know who he is. And I wangled a meeting. Let's meet for coffee. He didn't know me. He probably knew who I was, but didn't. And I did that about six months ago. And when I mentioned the expression solo album, he said, is it just you? I said, no. He said, then it's not a solo album. So ever since then, he's correct, of course. <laughs> but, but the way he said it, uh, I twitch if I hear the expression solo album. It's my new album, uh, yeah, which we can call solo album, but it, it isn't solo. In fact, uh, kind of the main thing about it is the amazing cast of, of uh, support, featured musicians that I assembled to play with me. I think seven different drummers of my favorite drummers. It wasn't my intention, like how many drummers can I have? But uh, each piece as I got really close to the finished reality of what it was, I said to myself as a gift, which of the great drummers I know, which guy would really just, I don't have to say anything to him, just send it to him and he'll surprise me, but he'll be himself. And so I did that and I, I have wonderful guys, not just uh, not just drummers, but guitar players. So that I would imagine that process was you recording in your home studio, sending files back and forth, or did you get together with some of these people in the studio? Yes, together with some of them in the studio, but not. Uh, but, but I started everything right here in the room I'm in uh, with the, the, a little bit with the bass, but the composition and I let it be what it is. Sometimes that involved playing all of the, the parts myself in a pathetic way, not the drums. Drums, I I always work to, let me sidetrack, I do that a lot. Uh, I work with a lot of great drummers, trading files and doing pieces. And I've learned in order to not get attached to a drum loop or a drum machine part, uh, don't start, for me, just don't start with it. So I'm sending a drummer either a click track or no drums at all. 
In other words, I'm not implying what they should play. Even if they thought I wasn't implying it, most of the very experienced drummers that I work with have been asked so many times in their life, oh, can you play it more like this demo part that I created myself? And it's insulting to them and it gets understandably it gets them in a bad mood so i'm never going to be the guy not only to say that but i'm not even going to send them or maybe a bass drum and a backbeat or something so there's that's my process with drums yes i started things here and in some cases i went in the studio with the other people different studio not here uh with manu Kache, i could only catch him when we were on the road last year with peter gabriel we had a night off in uh, montreal and we went to the studio we did the drums what a treat that was take one was for me that was on the piece called Bringing It Down to the Bass, same title as the album. And I take one, I was like, let's pack up and go have dinner. That was perfect. Oh, no, uh, I need to do another one. So we, we, we didn't have a big fight, but I knew I was going to be very happy with the, his first reaction to the piece. Yeah, you got uh, Robert Fripp on there as well. Um, so what was it like working with him outside the context of King Crimson and other times that you've worked with him, You know, having him appear on your record? Yeah, I didn't really do it that way. When we toured with King Crimson for a lot in the last 10 years, over the last 10 years, Robert got in the habit of making a soundscape after sound check before people come in. And it would play all the time from, let's say, 4.30 until 8 o'clock, because we started right at 8 o'clock, not a minute late, not a minute early. Uh, the tour manager with a with a, a countdown clock right at the side of the stage, we're ready to, I mean, not even five seconds late ever. Anyway, some nights, as we're about to go on, and this, this eerie soundscape is playing, he would say, Tony, you go on for, you go, go on first and play. Your, usually it was the upright I had set up. We just played in my soundscape. So I did that a few times. And then he got in the habit, jazz players, all jazz players will know about this. If there's a way to signal keys to each other, like uh, this means two flats, means B flat, one sharp is key of G. So instead of asking me to do that, Robert would just, just somewhere across the room, he would go, you know, what sharp. And I'd say, okay, in his mind, this, what sounds like a cluster of notes, it has a key base and it, it would be, you know, my first note would be maybe that G. And we carried, because we to a lot of shows, we carried that to where he would go, you know, his, his hand signals to me would be the impossible thing that is the key that is it because it's in no key okay so i did a lot of that and and he asked me after one of the tours to maybe take one and uh make a record out of it or make a track out of it and i didn't i was busy doing something else right after that making my own album i got the idea asked him if it was okay and without even telling him which soundscape i just took one of the soundscapes and really lived with it a while and came up with it just a bass to go with it it was just going to be bass and soundscape but then I decided it could use just a little something at the end. And I asked Jerry Murat or my friend to play some percussion for the last 30 seconds of it. So it's a long story, but very different than, hey, Robert, come on to my house and play a soundscape. It wasn't like that at all. By the way, uh, uh, before you ask that, I was going to mention uh, one of the tracks, talking about trading files with Vinnie Caliuto, I had determined early on to do a duet, kind of a, imp well, definitely an improvised a jam with the Chapman stick, which is kind of can be funky and cover a lot more ground than the bass, at least the way I play it, the bass. Uh, uh, and I, I've kind of worked out a better way to trade files with drummers to be spontaneous than to just do it, send them to him, which I could do and say, hey, play to this. So I, I, as I told him, I'll, I'll do a rough version of what I'm going to do and please play to it, but don't bother to be exactly with it and add something if you want. And then and this is what we did. And he, then he sent me that drum part and I played to the drums, although I remembered what I had done in the original. So in a way, I mean, it's still not perfect. It's still not as great as being in the same studio at the same time, but we're very far apart and our schedules were crazy. Uh, and that way we both get to just react to the other guy a little bit more than if we just did, if I had sent him the finished deal. So I was pleased with the way that came out. And that's kind of the way most of the drum tracks on the album worked out. I redid, the, maybe not in every case, but usually I redid the bass uh, to be locked in and to just feel right with the drummer rather than with the click the way I recorded it to begin with. I was going to ask that if the drummer was following you or if you were kind of following the drummer, but it, it's nice to hear there was some cohesiveness, some interplay there. I think it makes it alive. Yeah. Now. 
I do a lot of recording from home on people's albums, and that's a big issue. Because this track you're sending me, is that the final drums? Because if I play, I can only play, I'm speaking for myself here as a bass player, or as me, I can only play to what I hear. I can't imagine that the drums are going to be better or different or more in time. So if this is the final drums, great. If they're not in time, great. But if you're going to add a guy after I played wrong to be with the, the current guy, well, let's talk about that and let's not waste our time doing that. So another big thing you have going on is is the beat tour. You're getting ready for that, I would imagine. I spoke with uh, Steve Vai a few months ago. He was very excited. He wasn't able to say what it was at the time, but he, he was already very excited about it, already preparing for it. Uh, I assume he's going to do an amazing job. He, he's 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 got the heavy lifting. I mean, all he's got to do is play what Robert Fripp played on on a guitar. Robert has amazing technique, of course, and plays on a guitar two and fifths. So there's that. And uh, yeah, Steve's got a heck of a job. Uh, me not so much, but as we speak, I've I've started listening to the old the '80s pieces and the tracks, the, the parts that I played. There's some tough stuff for me to do. Tough not because it's fast or, or technically, but uh, for instance, I'm playing in one time signature on the top of the stick and playing in a different time signature on the bass. Okay, I can get back to that and I kind of remember it. But then singing with Adrian, who's singing out of time and watching his lips and trying to... <laughs> and so to do, you know, it'll be fine by the time we play. We get a lot of rehearsing. Uh, but to do that, I have to get so into my fingers the five versus six that I'll be playing that I don't actually have to think about that and I can just think about what I'm singing. So stuff like that. Uh, I got a lot of work, but I will keep reminding myself that Steve Vai has really the heavy lifting. And Adrian, really, to to get back to singing and playing these these pieces, uh, it's a big job for him. And, and the guys have been working on a lot. I'm looking forward. We're all excited about it. I'm looking, as, as we speak, you and I... Uh, I haven't gone into rehearsals. I'm only a few days away from starting rehearsals. I'm very much looking forward to it, excited to see where the music goes and um, um, how, how much it varies from the way we did it in the 80s. And that's fine if it does. I'm relearning the tempos of these pieces from the 80s. Tempos are really important to me, I guess to all bass players. And some of them through the years, we changed the tempo either on purpose or not, but uh, that's fine. I know the last tempo that I did Elephant Talk, for instance, but I'm hearing it's uh, quite a bit faster in the, on the original, uh, and we'll have that discussion. And that, to me, that's an interesting part of it. The, the tempos affect a lot of things. So right now, you're all just kind of individually working on your own parts, and have you had one of those collaborative rehearsals yet at all? It, it'll, I ex I've done this kind of thing a lot, and I expect it'll be daunting the first few days, and... and I don't know about the other guys, but I'll tro probably be taking the, the stick back to the hotel room and woodshedding, realizing the bits that I didn't learn that I should have or the tempos that are way faster than I learned them at. In, in other words, I, I'd i like to come in 100% prepared, but I probably won't. I'll forgive myself for that, but it'll be, oh, gosh. But we did wisely, but quite a bit of rehearsal time, so it's not like a panic at all. Had you ever played with Danny Carey before? Uh, and, and what are your thoughts on playing uh, this, the King Crimson stuff with him? I'm excited. I'm excited about playing with him, with just the two of us. I have played with him <clears throat> a couple of times in a King Crimson context, him sitting in with King Crimson with multiple drummers, which is great, but really different than, than it'll be. So I'm looking forward to it. He's a great guy. I've met him and hung out with him quite a few times. Uh, so looking forward to it. So back when you recorded this material, um, you know, you were doing a lot of sessions at the time, a lot of high profile sessions. Where did this rank for you, you know, working with Fripp and, and Adrian and in the context of King Crimson? Was it really challenging? Uh, I know Robert has a very unique musical mind, as, as we've heard many times. For sure. So we're talking about 1980, I think, that I worked rehearsed with the band and we got the idea of it in 1981 when we made the Discipline album. Uh, I, at that time, I was sort of, if I can remember at that time, I had been a, what I would call a studio musician. I was based in New York. I did a lot of recordings, but I was getting out of that because I had played with Peter Gabriel. Well, I was well out of it because in 76, I had played with Peter Gabriel, met Robert Fripp, played on Robert's solo album, Exposure, 
but did not tour with that. And I had done a number of tours with Peter, and it was very clear to me that that's what I love to do. That's why I took up music to play for people who appreciate the music with good musicians. I don't mind recording, but that's not why I went into music. I kinda, it's kind of a craft that I visit and I can do it okay. Uh, so then when I was asked to not to join King Crimson, but to join this new group that Robert was starting, we were gonna call it Discipline. Um, it, it was a shock because Robert, I knew Robert and his playing and his unique playing and his great musicality. I didn't know Adrian and Adrian's playing. So suddenly to be in a band with two guitars who had their own unique sound and their own technique and just sound each different than anybody else, but nothing like each other. And then Bill Bruford plays, plays and played entirely different than any American drummer or any drummer, but I played all of American drummers and I wasn't versed in progressive rock and what it can be like and what's even like to be with a drummer whose main value is creating something that hasn't been created before, who's not devoted his whole life to just copying the groove the way we American rhythm sections, bass and drums, and me especially, uh, do. We spent our career doing that. So I quickly, in that one day, I, I could see I got to change direction and become like these guys creatively, or I just don't fit in this band. Musically, that's what's appropriate. Fortunately for me, I played at that time the Chapman Stick, which is not the same old four strings, it's not the same tuning, it's not the same sound. So I could, uh, I really embraced that. And when I go back and listen to the material, I'm surprised again at how much of I did, how much of it I did on the stick as opposed to the bass. Um, and I know why, I was just trying to push myself out of the comfort zone and copying the groove and trying to be more like Bill Bruford and create stuff that, that I hadn't done before. I hope you don't mind a very long answer to a short question. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, you know, I, I love hearing about those days. Um, and, and you all meshed so well. Was there a moment that, that it really clicked for you that this was something special? This was a special group of musicians? I'm only guessing because it was a long time ago and memories are funny. We all know that. Uh, but I think right away in the room with those guys, let me tell you something amusing to me. Years later, I think decades later, I, I found out that I was being auditioned. I didn't know that. <laughs> in my naivety, in my never asking why I'm here, I, I just go and play the bass. I never think about why I'm there or who asked me. Uh, so I thought, oh, it's a band, and, and maybe we'll, maybe it'll work and we'll do it. And I didn't realize or ask that, that, that they were doing the same with other bass players. Uh, so it was it was special and different from the beginning. And at one point, they were they bring out new material. I guess that Robert had in mind. I don't remember that for sure. Maybe Adrian pieces, but probably Robert pieces. And I was kind of comfortable with that. And then they suggested that we play the King Crimson piece. Yes, which well, read the piece read, which I had never heard. <laughs> I didn't know it. And I was a quick learner. Fortunately, in those days, I was a very quick learner. So they were probably impressed. Part of the reason that they accepted me in the band was that I picked up Red pretty quickly and was able to play it with them. I, I laugh at it now because I know it pretty well now. I really wasn't uh, versed in King Crimson. The same way as when I met and recorded with Peter Gabriel, I didn't know about Genesis. I didn't even hear them. Yeah, your your ability to adapt to a wide variety of these collaborative efforts with all these different artists. Was there a certain artist or band or project that you worked on that really challenged you, either because the material just didn't really mesh with how you felt it should go or or just stuff that was really challenging for you? Yeah, for sure, uh, really a lot, probably too many for me to put my my uh, finger on one of them. I, I think the process of doing a lot of records and recordings is, involves sometimes when the music isn't right for you, and sometimes when it isn't good, and you can't help, you can't make it better. I, I recorded through the disco era, let me remind myself and you. So if you can imagine, uh, the disc, all the disco tracks that somebody wrote with the synth bass, which was new then, but work where, where it goes boom, 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 you know, octaves or boom, 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 boom. Okay, but we want Tony to play on this. Come on. And it took me a while to realize that to not ever be on the sessions because <laughs> even though I can play those notes, it won't feel right. Maybe I can't even do them as so well, but actually the sound and the feel is to have the synth do it. That's just one of, example of, of probably dozens of, of times that I was the wrong player in the wrong place 
and uh, I did what I did was different each time, but you do what you can. You try and make uh, the best of it and make the music come out as well as you can. I, I, there's no examples where I packed up my bass case and walked out, but there have been a few examples where people have said, it's not working out. Why don't you pack up your bass and walk out? Probably more than a couple uh, examples of that. I, I, I do think that's kind of useful information for people, for some bass player who's starting out a recording career might, might be good, useful for them to remember the, oh yeah, that guy Tony Levin said that happened to him throughout his career, not just at the beginning. <laughs> When you're the wrong person, either for yourself to do the music or the, or or to the artist, then, then it can't work out too well. Do you remember any of those gigs that you were you were asked to, that uh, maybe you weren't the right bass player for? It, I'm trying to think not only of some, but of some that I want to talk about publicly. Because if the other guy looks like a bad guy, then I I, I can tell my friends about it, but I'm not going to. Uh, uh, talk about so not, not, none comes to mind that I want to share now. If they do, uh, it, it could be in 15 minutes, something will come to mind. Oh, yeah, that one was well, well, uh, not a bad one, but uh, Nick Di Virgilio, wonderful drummer and singer, progressive, progressive rock does great stuff. And, and every few years, he'll ask me to play on a track or two on his records from here in my home studio. And the last time, I don't remember if it was a year ago, two years, I'm not good at time frames, but. He sent me one kind of tricky piece, and as usual, he had done a rough bass part, and and I could listen to that or not. It was on a separate track. That's the way I like to, you know, let me see what I want to do in it, but let me see what you're doing. It was, it was a pretty tricky piece, and from the beginning, I listened to the bass part he had played himself, and it was great. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll incorporate this from that and this, and then as as I got used to the piece, I realized that I, I couldn't beat what he played. In, even for any notes. So I thought, well, do I want to just play every note that he played and send them back to track? And I don't. And then I wrote him a, a really cute email saying, you know, <laughs> your bass plan is getting really good and I cannot improve on what you got. So that was one where I happily stepped away from the track. I didn't mind. I wasn't embarrassed about it, but I could not have made up a better part than the one he had. So why should I? It's a high compliment coming from you, of course. So. Um, uh, forgive me for this, uh, a bit of an abstract question, but, uh, what constitutes to you, a, a good bass part, a, a good bass track? I know maybe it varies from project to project, but is there something, uh, that kind of binds all good bass tracks together? Interesting question. Let me say first that I like. I think all of us bass players listen to music or even hear music and are aware on some level of what the bass player is doing, if there is a bass player, and learn from that. It's rare now that I actually sit down and listen to the radio in the car or something, but if I do, uh, some great stuff is being played, and I kind of incorporate that often consciously, but if not, later, if I've heard a song a lot, I can kind of hum, sing to myself the bass part. And also conversely, if the bass is doing something that doesn't work in my estimation, and I think other bass players are like this, you kind of learn, well, oh yeah, I'm not the sound that they, that record has, the bass sound really conflicts with the drums. So they've turned the bass down and down. It's just not, it doesn't have its own frequency or something, but I don't want to ever be in that situation. So I'm always kind of learning from stuff uh, that I listen to from bass parts, uh, usually learning wow, that, that's a good thing that that person did and I, I should do that. If I'm listening to, if it's me, I don't think in those terms, I just fashion the best part I can to go with that piece with the help maybe of the artist or the songwriter. If it's uh, if it's something on the radio, some piece I heard, uh, there is no rule. It's like every other listener. It works for me and I smile and I think, wow, that's a great bass part. Then it's great. If it's, maybe I'm a little more fussy about it than other people. Let me tell you a, a Jacko story, Jacko Pastorius, of course, inspirational to a lot of bass players, to all of us who were around at that time. His first solo album, which kind of rocked the jazz world, very, for those who weren't around or don't know, very uh, technical, super technique for those days, and nobody was doing what he did, and on fretless bass, which is extraordinary. It kind of left me cold. I didn't dislike it, but it was really fast and, and flashy. I'll put it in the context of your question. It wasn't what I consider. None of the pieces were what I considered a great bass part. But 
then uh, not too long afterwards, I heard him play with with uh, Joni Mitchell on the Hegira record, her record, and his parts were so sublime. They were so almost unimaginably right musically that I didn't want to hear myself play the fretless bass again at all. I just put it away. What ended to be years. It was years before I touched my fretless bass. Uh, the point isn't that I put it away. It was just like, oh my God. He's How good was it? He was playing musically the stuff that I, in my dreams or in my imagination, that I could play on fretless. That in tune and that every note right, and every note enhancing the piece, not taken away from it. So there's an example of a good bass part, so much that it makes you put your bass away. Me too. I play it a lot now, including on the new album. You could say that I've forgotten and not gone back to, to be humbled. Or, or you could say that I, I can exist with being humbled and still being a fretless. Right before you kind of joined Fripp and those guys to, to do Disciple, or what would become King Crimson, another incarnation of it, uh, you had recorded yeah. with John and Yoko. And, uh, of course, I got to ask how, how that was, how that experience was for you, and how did that prepare you, perhaps, for the King Crimson experience? It's an interesting question. It didn't have anything to do with it. It was right at the same time frame, end of 1980, I think. Uh, terrific opportunity. Uh, it was it was sweet. It was great. Uh, I, I've told this many times. Sometimes we don't remember what happened, we remember ourselves telling the story of what happened. But I have been asked so many times. I remember when I first came into the studio, the Hit Factory on uh, 48th Street, I think, in Manhattan, uh, uh, John came up to me, said, he said in a very confrontational way, in a very New York way, they tell me you're good, just don't play too many notes, was what he said. And I smiled, thinking, yeah, that's I'm comfortable with that kind of like boom, you know. Just don't play too many notes. They tell me you're good, and of course I understand that he was told he didn't know my playing. He was told by someone else that I'm good, and he thought, well, maybe he's one of those guys who's just going to make a mess of my song. And I had a smile because I know that I'm pretty sparse about notes, uh, and it was it was it was a great great opportunity. My thoughts is he he would sing a song and a new song and play guitar where there must be a thousands of bass players who could be the one here who could play a very good job on this i'm just one of them and how lucky am i that i'm the one who's called to be here and okay enough of that let me just play uh and maybe there was one point where i i, I reacted the, the bass part i played was a little beatles ish and this was just in two seconds my my even as i started to do that my instinctive brain said oh, oh, don't do that that's beatles ish and then i thought oh this is not beatles ish this is john and and if that's the way that's appropriate for john's song then it's okay i don't mean i was copying the paul line but it was just kind of stylistically uh i thought yeah this one time i can let myself do that without i'm not uh, taking it somewhere else it's kind of where it was to begin with so there was that uh it was only two weeks of sessions really that we did they made two albums out of it and then there was the tragedy of the way things ended. We were going to do a world tour. He was talking about a tour starting in uh, maybe February. Uh, you know, the one regret I have about, I'm a photographer also, and I've released a few photo books of, of some studio, but mostly uh, on the road with King Crimson and Peter Gabriel. And I had my camera, as I always do at the session, and on one break when he and Yoko, John and Yoko were listening to a playback in the control room, I came in with my camera and I said, I looked at the two of them and I said, do you guys mind if I take a photo? And John said, I'd rather you didn't. And that's my one regret. I wish I had taken the picture and then asked. And I, I don't think he would have sent me home in anger. I think he would have said, please don't take any pictures. And I would have that one picture, even if it was blurry, to remind myself of that. So uh, I regret that was my one misstep on that album. You also were on Momentary Lapse of Reason, of course, with uh, Pink Floyd. Uh, what was that experience like? I guess somewhat, I don't know if replacing Roger Waters is the correct word to use, but I'm going to use it anyway. But uh, what, what was that like? Was there some added pressure? No pressure. No, very different. All sessions seem to be different, but that one was kind of in its own department. Uh, leading up to it, it was Bob Ezrin, the producer, who had worked 
did Peter Gabriel's first album and called me for that. And I've done a number of albums with him through the years who asked me to be there in Los Angeles. Leading up to it, I had the thought of maybe I should bone up on Pink Floyd music. And I thought, not necessary, really. There's plenty of time. There's no rush to do these, and, and we'll see what's appropriate. David Gilmore, I, it turned out, I found out, is a great guy uh, musically, but also a really sweet person, very patient. And, and anyway, I fell in, I, I think I fell into playing in the style that was appropriate for the music. I was not trying to copy Roger Waters or be Roger Waters. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not the only time I've stepped into a band when the bass player who's really a part of the band isn't there for one reason or another. But I, I guess I just try to not think about that. I don't, yeah, I, I try not to think down the road. Uh, so it was, it was a pleasure. It was uh, not complex musically, but uh, Bob Ezrin, uh, as you will do in a Pink Floyd thing, he, he brought a lot of care and thought and unusual processes to doing the recording. So for instance, one piece I was playing the stick on the, on the verses and the bass on the choruses, something I, I've never tried on my own. And it was kind of worked. It was kind of cool. So a lot of stuff like that. And uh, uh, yeah, I enjoyed the process. I, I'll tell you the most interesting story of it. It was, I think, is in my memory, it was in May. I'm not sure of the year, but it was in the month of May. And I had I was on a break from a Peter Gabriel tour, which was going to end in September. And near the end of the album, David asked me if I could do the tour, the Pink Floyd tour, starting the following September. And I took a deep breath and I thought, well, gee, I could, maybe I could get out of the end of Peter Gabriel's tour, but that would feel weird. I've done all of Peter's tours ever. So I decided to stay on Peter's tour and say no to Pink Floyd's tour. Sadly, I would like to do both. You can't always freelance. You can't always do everything. And David's such a nice guy that a year and a half later, when that tour was ending, he, uh, in New Jersey, he thought of calling me and asking me to come to the last show and join him at the party to celebrate the end of the tour. I'm the guy who didn't do the tour, and that's the kind of guy he is. You've had so many, uh, so many of these experiences that are just so incredible. Um, I don't even know where to start with with coming up with questions for you, but uh, I did hear that you got to jam with uh, Eddie Van Halen at one point, which, as I understand it, is somewhat rare for him to play outside the context of, of Van Halen. So what was that experience like? I didn't, I didn't know that about him, but I did sense that. It was, a, uh, it was in New York. It was a tribute to Les Paul, the, what do you call it, a concert with a whole bunch of guitar players who played Les Paul guitars. But after, the, I don't know who the producers were, after a while, they, they started bringing in Fender players and other players because they wanted uh, named guitar players. And I was in the house band. So I wasn't playing everything, but most most of the people I was playing with him, there were people like B.B. King, uh, uh, gee, well, he, a man one that sticks in my head. But but anyway, Eddie Van Halen for sure. Oh, I, I have another story about this. But yeah, Eddie seemed not reluctant, but out of his context, he used to playing drums with his brother, and it was Rick Morata. I remember this about Rick, excellent drummer. And, and Eddie turned to him and said, why aren't you playing... Taka, 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 on the bass drum <laughs> it's because rick only has one bass drum he doesn't have the two and the, the pedals <laughs> and he, he's not going to do that he can do something like that on the tom so that's one moment i remember the concert was fine it was a great concert really a lot of stars but and and uh i have another david gilmore story and i'm glad to publicize this i don't know if i've said this to many people but midway in the week of rehearsing with the the Acts, the guitar players who were coming in, uh, the, produ the producers called me and they said, we're short, we need another guitar player or two. We're thinking of asking David Gilmore to come in at that time to get David was out on tour with uh, Pink Floyd. And we hear you know him. And I was like, well, I, I know him, but I don't know him to call him and ask him to, to hire him for a gig. <laughs> and uh, I said, I'll do what I can. And I called the management of Pink Floyd and I uh, said that I'd like, like to get a message to, to David if I could. And then the phone rang 10 minutes later with David. He said, what is it? I said, I explained there's next Saturday in Brooklyn, there's this show tribute to Les Paul. And David said, oh yeah, oh, okay, I'll be there. Just tell me the address. So I, I, I said, no, no, let me put you in touch with the, the producers, the management. So, you know, no, just 
I'll be there. And he was, and he did it pretty great. I I wouldn't have, if I was on the road with some other band, I'd be like, well, you got to send me a plane ticket and uh, what's the deal? Is there a hotel? You know, it's just the logistics. They would just say, yeah, I'll do it. So uh, you've mentioned a few times where you played the Chapman stick. Of course, you're very famous for playing that. Uh, it's a very unique instrument. When you started playing the Chapman stick, did it change your approach to the more conventional, traditional bass when you'd pick one of those up? Interesting question. Uh, no, it didn't. But um, the reason it didn't was because I played the bass with a hammer-on tapping technique before I got the stick. In fact, that's why I got the, the Chapman stick. I heard this. Many people told me, hey, there's this new instrument out that's designed to play the way we've seen you play in the bass. So, so technically, that part of the technique was an easy change for me. There's other things about the sticks that were very challenging, like the tuning and the strings being backwards and keeping it quiet between notes, uh, very low action. And of course, I got used to it after a while. And it was really probably a couple of years before I took on the top guitar strings, which are ster stereo output, so you could just mute them. So I just stayed to the bass, the, what at that time were five bass strings for years. Uh, but with King Crimson, I started playing the guitar side. Uh, so it, it didn't change the way I played the bass. In fact, uh, uh, bringing it down to the bass, the title track of uh, and the first uh, single from uh, the new uh, CD uh, is played with that technique. Uh, on many of the album, uh, the pieces on my album, I tried to use a specific bass technique and, and build a, a really good piece around it. The funk fingers, some fingernail playing, and in this case, uh, playing bass with a, like it was a stick. When you see some other people trying to do the, the hammer-on style that I guess you popularized for, for most of us, um, do you see certain mistakes that you know younger players are making when they're covering some of your stuff and, and trying to do that tapping, which is very difficult to do? No, it's the opposite. First of all, I don't go watching people what they're doing with a critical eye and i'm not a teacher and so uh the only time i pay attention to techniques is when mine is wrong and i'm looking to see a better way to do that and on the stick there there have there are lots of people with better technique than me and occasionally i've written to guys saying here's the part i want to play how what am i doing wrong and, yeah so i'm more that kind of guy more the student than the teacher uh and i don't think of myself as the beginning of the tapping world uh Certainly not, because Stanley Jordan famously came out with a, a whole album of pl playing that way on a guitar. And probably there were people doing it on bass before and during when I was doing it on bass before 75, before the Chapman Stick came out. I'm not aware of them, but also I, I wasn't doing it in a, on a, in a King Crimson or Peter Gabriel context. So not a lot of people. I wasn't influencing people at all with that technique. So I, I think on the Chapman Stick, there's a community of, of players who are really excellent and it's a kind of wide open instrument where people can do their own thing. So you'll see a lot of people doing techniques you never even thought of because it's a, it's still the, the wild west years at the early days of what can be done on the Chapman stick and on other touch guitars, by the way, in Stickman, I'm partners with Marcus Reuter who, who played the Chapman stick and then he developed his own touch. He calls it the touch guitar. And it's it's same technique, but it's more of a guitar played like this, where I play more like this, kind of a whole different thing, but with the same uh, tech technique. One of the projects that you were on that I I loved a lot was the Liquid Tension Experiment. Uh, I think I've interviewed everybody who was in that, except for you, and they've all had very glowing reviews of of your work in that band. So I'm curious uh, what your thoughts are on. Well, what are they What are they gonna say? It's a good band, except for that the old guy. He, you can't keep up with us. What are they going to say? But uh, we're good friends. And I'm not surprised that they spoke well of me, and I will speak even better of them. Yeah, uh, we've had quite a long life, considering we haven't had the chance to do much touring together and only a little chance to do recording. Those guys are, the three guys are virtuosos on their instrument. I get around and I can play my instrument quite well. I'm not in their league, technically, and we all know that. We don't discuss it, but we know that, and, and they obviously they tolerate me uh, playing catch up. And I'm used to being the guy in a band context who's the first one to learn stuff. I'll give you a good example. We get together. This has happened many times, but specifically the last when we got together during 
2020, the lockdown year, and we said, oh, okay, we've got to make a new album. And John Petrucci, was, we're all set up, we've done the sound. He'll say, okay, I got this riff, I got a new idea, and it'll sound like this. You know, but long, it was just the blizzard of notes, right? And Jordan listens, and then Jordan is playing it. He just learned it just that quick. He heard it, and he learned maybe he playing it with both hands, <laughs> double it, right? And I'm like, could you just play those first? Blah, 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 blah. And I got a pencil and, and music paper, by the way, because if I could play it, I still won't remember it when it's you know, 30 seconds later and the riff is still going, right? And it, so I'm, I'm literally saying, could, could you just play those first eight, no, eight notes shorter? But then Jordan says, you know what? That reminds me of this riff. I can, and, and Jordan does a thing, and John learns it just as quickly as Jordan did. So now... The piece is two minutes long, right? And Mike says, well, well, then we go into this. And these guys have composed three minutes of stuff. And I'm stand, I'm there in a different room <laughs> in, the, in the bass chamber with the headphones on with my pencil. And I can't, can't play the first riff. So I don't know how to. So that's the way we write. And at some point, I'll catch up and I'll learn the stuff, however it is, however long it takes me. And I, whatever I have to do, I'll learn it. But at some point, they'll say, OK, now, Tony, give us a King Crimson kind of riff. And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm going to play a bass part, not fast like theirs, but, you know, some riff. And it, and it, and that's the way the pieces quickly grow to be 10 minutes, 12 minutes long. Meanwhile, like, you know, the pencil's on the music stand, but I can't play the first minute of a piece. Sometimes I never do. We did one piece. Oh, I forget the name. It was kind of the main piece on the album before the last one. And, and I never, I just laid out the first riff rather than spend the six months it would take me to play it learn to play it by the way i've seen people online play it bass play it on bass so uh, yeah I, i'm honored to be in the group with them i like being challenged as you could tell having talked to me for a little bit and um it's when we play live that the challenge gets really real uh the last tour we did which is quite a while ago i pretty much did nothing but practice for the six months before it to not embarrass myself on stage with them and i'm not oh, okay with it but i didn't nail all the riffs especially that one that I never learned. Uh, and I didn't embarrass myself. And I, I felt good being on stage with them. So they're great players. They kicked my butt. And they're great guys. Not currently and probably not for a while. You never know. But with that kind of, I don't know what you call I call it a collaboration. And that way it's on the cusp between being in a band being a band in a collaboration. But with anything that's not your main band, you have the issue of the guys have their main band. Dream Theater is writing and they're going to tour for, what, a year? And so they can't do that. And if you're in different bands, then it can be many years between, uh, at least nine months before, if not a year before, you have to all be willing to, okay, let's take April and devote it to, to Liquid Tension Experiment. So on the horizon, one hopes, but uh, we don't know. Not next April, for sure. So I did have one last question for you. Uh, your discography is so huge, but uh, you know, he, you got to make a couple records with your brother, which had to have been a really cool experience for you. Uh, if you wanted to touch on that and where that ranks in uh, the last discography yeah. that you have. Really special. I don't rank things, let alone albums, let alone my own albums, but uh, really special. But we only dis he lives in the same area as me, upstate few hours north of New York City. And uh, not that many years ago, way into our careers, we decided, hey, let's do an album together that's just, uh, that's our band. Not sp We're playing on other people's albums together. I think of Pete as a, he's a keyboard player. Uh, he grew up playing French horn, but switched to keyboards. And I think of him as a jazz player who plays rock. He certainly plays rock well, but jazz. But I think of myself as a rock player who can play jazz, who visits it. But I hear in my jazz playing, the difference between a bass player who lives jazz and the, just the feel of four is not a simple thing. And I, I do it okay. But anyway, I, I'm a rock player who plays jazz. So let's form a jazz band. And, and we decided in the beginning to revisit the music we grew up with, which was a long time ago. Uh, and Pete then, when we were kids, he could afford records. So it was his records. And uh, it was a style of jazz called uh, uh, cool jazz. And, and the pieces were pretty succinct, short, like three minutes long. The solo, one guy would solo in the verse and someone else solo in the chorus. 
and they do the head out and it's over. So it's easy, an easy to grasp kind. And we decided to write music, maybe to do one or two of the, the songs we grew up with, but to write music in that style, which is very easy. So we did our first album that way, got two other guys to make it a quartet, really had fun. So now it's a standard, we've just been talking today about next year, do you have a break next May? Well, I can, man. So seeing if we can uh, put in some j jazz gigs are not that easy to book, not quite the same as taking a rock band to, to a club. But uh, we continue to do stuff every year, and it's a labor of love. It's really fun. We put out albums every few years. Um, so that's all the questions I had. Um, but thank you so much for, for all the music you've put in the world and continuing to put in the world and for just being one of the best guys uh, in rock and roll. Oh, you're very kind. Thank you. Thanks for your time and for, for the, uh, it really helps me when you ask really good questions. And so you, you spurred me to laugh and to, to use my brain instead of just the, the, the usual. So I appreciate Thank that. You. Thank you.